After the First World War, Paris continued to enjoy its position as the preeminent cultural capital of Europe. Escaping from the chaos of the war's aftermath and drawn to the city's dynamic culture, painters from Eastern Europe, such as Passin, Soutine, Lipschitz, Kisling, Chagall, and Emile Lanner became important contributors to the movement known as l'Ecole de Paris, the School of Paris. Emile Lanner was born on September 28, 1893, in the village of Naj Berenza in the Carpathian Mountains. His early life was marked by two tragedies. His mother died in childbirth, and at the age of seven, Lanner lost his father in an accident. The young orphan was placed in the care of a bishop guardian. In his youth, an event occurred that sparked the young Emile's interest in what would later become his passion. He came upon a man restoring a crucifix near his village. The artisan, sensing the boy's curiosity, offered him a tube of green paint. Emile's guardian sent him to boarding school and then on to begin his training as an engineer. This certainly was not the young man's choice. And upon his graduation in 1910, Lanier was able to take up his true calling, oil painting. During his studies at the School of Fine Arts, Lanier visited an art exhibition in Lausanne, Switzerland. There he saw for the first time paintings by Van Gogh and Monet. They had a profound impact on the young artist, so much so that he made a life-altering decision. He would move to Paris, where he would be able to study the masters at first hand. Well, it wouldn't have been unusual for an artist at that time, living elsewhere, to be attracted to Paris. And uh, the city really hosted a kind of world art community that developed then what we would call the French period of, of modernism. Lanner arrived in Paris in 1924. It must have been a tremendously exciting time for the devoted young Hungarian. The city was, as always, in great artistic ferment. That that's what they were responding to, and it was a means in which to bring color forward as uh, a primary subject matter. Uh, we can think of the influences of Mondrian also. Uh, though we see structure in Mondrian, we see a primacy of color, flat color, bold color, that eliminates then a whole history that we associate with the Renaissance of perspectives and shadows. It was truly the light of France and that concept of color that attracted him because it seems to be so instantly converted. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any long progress towards that. It was rather sudden. He got off the train and he was converted by the time he got to the street. While living in Paris, he traveled frequently to the Mediterranean light of Saint-Tropez and the south of France. Here, he spent summers painting seaside landscapes and villages, like the many other famous artists now surrounding him. We can think of the Impressionists had dealt exclusively then with the concept of light and color, which exclusively that was the subject matter. Uh, by the time in 1905, the Fauves, uh, Henri Matisse, color then was exclusively a subject matter. The artist then could arbitrarily choose the colors from will, so a tree didn't have to be rendered in any academic uh, manner. Uh, the artist could choose to make it any color he wished. And the idea was to liberate the canvas, the painting, in, in that way. Uh, so given the artist's choices of colors then, uh, colors became bolder. And also the, their connections in with a kind of new art history of looking into ethnographic art, the art of Africa and so forth, in which they discovered bold color patterns. It removed itself from uh, academic backgrounds in uh, European art, uh, was a foundation of modernism. The years following the stock market crash of 1929 were extremely difficult for most artists, including Lanair. In 1931, he moved to a working class neighborhood south of Montparnasse. He lived and painted in a tiny single room with a dirt-packed floor. 
led perhaps by his own hardships and deprivations, or by those he witnessed around him, Lanier began increasingly to portray the figure. Animals, acrobats, and idealized nudes now joined his early interest in the landscape. Yeah, I think in these paintings we see it in uh, similar to the style of the figure that we would see in Cezanne's Bathers. Uh, less a picture of the figure anatomically, but a presence of the figure integrated into a decorative pattern uh, within the context of the whole picture plane. Despite these difficult circumstances, Lanier exhibited his work in Paris, New York, Sao Paulo, and Boston. Absorbing the best influences, Lanier allowed his work to grow in maturity. A small but appreciative international audience recognized his talents and responded enthusiastically. Always pressing forward with his own experiments, Lanier began to develop his abstract style during this time. As the Third Reich rolled across Europe, Lanier joined many artists who took refuge in Vichy, France, in the Dordogne. He stayed with the Aversong family in their chateau and traveled throughout the region. Here he painted a number of views of the village of Cologne la Rouge, so named on account of the red sandstone of which most of the village was built. After the liberation of Paris in 1945, Lanier returned to the Rue de Perichaud where he began to exhibit his work more frequently. The post-war era was one of steady work for the artist and also one of extensive travel. Lanier's stay in the Dordogne during the war would exert a lasting influence on both his art and his career. He had avidly studied the primitive art covering the underground walls, and in the 1950s, these primitive elements were incorporated into a series of paintings called Préhistoire. That's always a, a chief, a main characteristic of modern art, and particularly in this period, were artists seeking then uh, civilizations and signs that came from other civilizations. Another factor which influenced Lanier's work was a commission made by his former hosts in the Dordogne, the Aversang family, to design a chapel for the town of El Afrun. The artist's exploration of stained glass and its refractive properties during this project had a profound impact on the remainder of his abstract work. The influences of uh, stained glass, uh, things that were traditional in French art, uh, particularly Cezanne, and breaking up uh, space into these prisms of light. It seems to be a strong characteristic in French art, and Cubism certainly emphasized this, was the uh, ex uh, subject matter of color itself. Color expresses itself and really has no reference to anything but its own presence. The 1950s also marked the beginning of two important relationships for the artist. In 1957, at the age of 64, he married Jeanne Cazenave, and in 1959, he met the California art dealer Laszlo Laki, who became one of his closest friends. In the spring of 1961, Lanier received critical success in a watershed exhibition at the Galerie Jean Castel. This exhibition was under the patronage of Lanier's old friend, Leopold Sander Senghor, a well-known poet and the former president of Senegal. 
Many of the abstract works of Lanier from the 1960s had the distinct geometric elements of stained glass, but Lanier pressed on with his personal experiments. Colored zones of his paintings abutted one another at sharp angles, conforming to the space defined by lines. Other colored forms were blurred at the edges, as they might be in nature. In terms of looking at this work, um, it's interesting in the context of his life and the decades that he lived through and his employment of line and how that relates to himself as an artist, as a person, as a human being. Um, and certainly having gone through the war and, um, and line as an element of description, as a describing element, as a defining element, um, uh, boundaries and territories I find interesting as many of his pieces. During the 1970s, Lanier exhibited both in Paris and in California. In the final decade of his career, Lanier had returned to his impressionistic roots for inspiration and produced some of his most imaginative works of his entire oeuvre. Mainly because of his uh, willingness to abandon um, certain forms and uh, vocabulary through the decades. And I think that um, that 